This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. The Blind Owl It was always my opinion that the best course a man could take in life was to remain silent. That one could not do better than withdraw into solitude like the bittern which spreads its wings beside some lonely lake. But now, since that which should not have happened has happened, I cannot help myself. Who knows? Perhaps in the course of the next few moments, perhaps in an hour's time, a band of drunken policemen will come to arrest me. I have not the least desire to save my carcass, and in any case it would be quite impossible for me to deny the crime, even supposing that I could remove the bloodstains. But before I fall into their hands I shall swallow a glass from the bottle of wine, my heirloom, which I keep on the top shelf. I wish now to squeeze out every drop of juice from my life as from a cluster of grapes, and to pour the juice, the wine, rather, drop by drop, like water of Karbala, the burial place of the Shia martyr Hossein. Water in which a little earth from Karbala had been steeped was employed as medicine. Down the parched throat of my shadow. All that I hope to do is to record on paper before I go the torments, which have slowly wasted me away like gangrene or cancer here in my little room. This is the best means I have of bringing order and regularity into my thoughts. Is it my intention to draw up a last will and testament? By no means. I have no property for the state to devour, I have no faith for the devil to take. Moreover, what is there on the face of the earth that could have the slightest value for me? What life I had I have allowed to slip away, I permitted it, I even wanted it, to go, and after I have gone what do I care what happens? It is all the same to me whether anyone reads the scraps of paper I leave behind, or whether they remain unread forever and a day. The only thing that makes me right is the need, the overmastering need, at this moment more urgent than ever it was in the past, to create a channel between my thoughts and my unsubstantial self, my shadow, that sinister shadow which at this moment is stretched across the wall in the light of the oil lamp in the attitude of one studying attentively and devouring each word I write. This shadow surely understands better than I do. It is only to him that I can talk properly. It is he who compels me to talk. Only he is capable of knowing me. He surely understands. It is my wish, when I have poured the juice, rather, the bitter wine, of my life down the parched throat of my shadow, to say to him, this is my life. Whoever saw me yesterday saw a wasted, sickly young man. Today he would see a bent old man with white hair, burnt out eyes, and a hair lip. I am afraid to look out of the window of my room, or to look at myself in the mirror for everywhere I see my own shadow multiplied indefinitely. However, in order to explain my life to my stooping shadow, I am obliged to tell a story. Ugh. How many stories about love, copulation, marriage and death already exist, not one of which tells the truth. How sick I am of well-constructed plots and brilliant writing. I shall try to squeeze out the juice from this cluster of grapes, but whether or not the result will contain the slightest particle of truth I do not yet know. I do not know where I am at this moment, whether the patch of sky above my head, and these few spans of ground on which I am sitting belong to Neshaper, or to Balk, or to Benares. I feel sure of nothing in the world. A reminiscence of a quatrain of Omar Khayyam, since life passes, whether sweet or bitter, since the soul must pass the lips, whether in the shaper or in bulk, drink wine, 
for after you and I are gone, many a moon will pass from old to new, from new to old. I have seen so many contradictory things, and have heard so many words of different sorts. My eyes have seen so much of the worn-out surface of various objects, the thin, tough rind behind which the spirit is hidden, that now I believe nothing. At this very moment I doubt the existence of tangible, solid things, I doubt clear, manifest truths. If I were to strike my hand against the stone mortar that stands in the corner of our courtyard and were to ask it, are you real and solid? And the mortar were to reply, yes, I do not know whether I should take its word or not. Am I a being separate and apart from the rest of creation? I do not know. But when I looked into the mirror a moment ago, I did not recognize myself. No, the old eye has died and rotted away, but no barrier, no gulf, exists between it and the new one. I must tell my story, but I am not sure at what point to start. Life is nothing but a fiction, a mere story. I must squeeze out the juice from the cluster of grapes, and pour it spoonful by spoonful down the parched throat of this aged shadow. At what point should I start? All the thoughts which are bubbling in my brain at this moment belong to this passing ins instant, and know nothing of hours, minutes and dates. An incident of yesterday may for me be less significant, less recent, than something that happened a thousand years ago. Perhaps for the very reason that all the bonds which held me to the world of living people have been broken the memories of the past take shape before my eyes. Past, future, hour, day, month, year, these things are all the same to me. The various phases of childhood and maturity are to me nothing but futile words. They mean something only to ordinary people, to the rabble, yes, that is the word I was looking for, the rabble, whose lives, like the year, have their definite periods and seasons and are cast in the temperate zone of existence. But my life has always known only one season and one state of being. It is as though it had been spent in some frigid zone and in eternal darkness, while all the time within me burned a flame which consumed me as the flame consumes the candle. Within the four walls that form my room, this fortress, which I have erected around my life and thoughts, my life has been slowly wasting away like a candle. No, I am wrong. It is like a green log which has rolled to one side of the fireplace, and which has been scorched and charred by the flames from the other logs. It has neither burnt away nor remained fresh and green. It has been choked by the smoke and steam from the others. My room, like all rooms, is built of baked and sun-dried bricks and stands upon the ruins of thousands of ancient houses. Its walls are whitewashed and it has a frieze around it. It is exactly like a tomb. I am capable of occupying my thoughts for hours at a stretch with the slightest details of the life of the room, for example, with a little spider in a crevice of the wall. Ever since I have been confined to my bed people have paid little attention to me. In the wall there is a horseshoe nail which at one time supported the swinging cradle where my wife and I used to sleep, and which since then may have supported the weight of other children. Just below the nail there is a patch where the plaster has swelled and fallen away, and from that patch one can detect the odors from the things and the people which have been in the room in the past. No draft or breeze has ever been able to dispel these dense, clinging, stagnant odors, the smell of sweat, the smell of bygone illnesses, the smell of people's mouths, the smell of feet, the acrid smell of urine, the smell of rancid oil, the smell of decayed straw matting, the smell of burnt omelets, the smell of fried onions, 
The smell of medicines. The smell of mallow. The smell of dirty napkins. The smell which you find in the rooms of boys lately arrived at puberty. The vapors which have seeped in from the street, and the smells of the dead and dying. All of these odors are still alive, and have kept their individuality. There are, besides, many other smells of unknown origins which have left their traces there. Opening off my room is a dark closet. The room itself has two windows facing out onto the world of the rabble. One of them looks onto our own courtyard, the other onto the street, forming thereby a link between me and the city of Ray, the city which they call the Bride of the World, with its thousandfold web of winding streets, its host of squat houses, its schools, and its caravanserais. The city which is accounted the greatest city in the world is breathing and living its life there beyond my room. When I close my eyes here in my little room the vague, blurred shadows of the city, of which my mind is at all times aware, whether consciously or not, all take substantial form and rise before me in the shape of pavilions, mosques and gardens. These two windows are my links with the outside world, the world of the rabble. But on the wall inside my room hangs a mirror in which I look at my face, and in my circumscribed existence that mirror is a more important thing than the world of the rabble men, which has nothing to do with me. The central feature of the city landscape, as seen from my window, is a wretched little butcher's shop directly opposite our house. It gets through a total of two sheep per day. I can see the butcher every time I look out of the window. Early each morning a pair of gaunt, consumptive-looking horses are led up to the shop. They have a deep, hollow cough, and their emaciated legs terminated by blunt hoofs give one the feeling that their fingers have been cut off in accordance with some barbarous law, and the stumps plunged into boiling oil. Each of them has a pair of sheep carcasses slung across its back. The butcher raises his greasy hand to his henna-dyed beard, and begins by appraising the carcasses with a buyer's eye. He selects two of them, and feels the weight of their tails with his hand. Finally he lugs them across, and hangs them from a hook at the entrance to the shop. Shop. The horse is set off, breathing hard. The butcher stands by the two blood-stained corpses with their gashed throats, and their staring bloody-lidded eyes bulging from the bluish skulls. He pats them and feels the flesh with his fingers. Then he takes a long bone-handled knife and cuts up their bodies with great care, after which he smilingly dispenses the meat to his customers. How much pleasure he derives from all these operations! I am convinced that they give him the most exquisite pleasure, even delight. Every morning at this time the thick-necked yellow dog, which has made our district his preserve, is there outside the butcher's shop. His head on one side, he gazes regretfully with his innocent eyes at the butcher's hand. That dog also understands. He also knows that the butcher enjoys his work. A little further away under an archway a strange old man is sitting with an assortment of wares spread out in front of him on a canvas sheet. They include a sickle, two horseshoes, assorted colored beads, a long bladed knife, a rat trap, a rusty pair of tongs, part of a writing set, a gap toothed comb, a spade, and a glazed jar over which he has thrown a dirty handkerchief. I have watched him from behind my window for days, hours and months. He always wears a dirty scarf, a schuster cloak, and an open shirt from which protrude the white hairs on his chest. He has inflamed eyelids which are apparently being eaten away by some stubborn, obtrusive disease. He wears a talisman tied to his arm, 
and he always sits in the same posture. On Thursday evenings, he reads aloud from the Quran, revealing his yellow, gappy teeth as he does so. One might suppose that he earned his living by this Quran reading, for I have never seen anyone buy anything from him. It seems to me that this man's face has figured in most of my nightmares. What crass, obstinate ideas have grown up, we'd like, inside that shaven greenish skull under its embroidered turban, behind that low forehead. One feels that the canvas sheet in front of the old man, with its assortment of odds and ends, has some curious affinity to the life of the old man himself. More than once I have made up my mind to go up and exchange a word with him, or buy something from his collection, but I have not found the courage to do so. According to my nurse, the old man was a potter in his younger days. After giving up that trade he kept only this one jar for himself, and now he earned his living by peddling. These were my links with the outside world. Of my private world all that was left to me were my nurse, and my bitch of a wife. But Nanny was her nurse too, she was nurse to both of us. My wife and I were not only closely related, but were suckled together by Nanny. Her mother was to all intents and purposes mine too, because I never saw my parents, but was brought up by her mother, a tall, grey-haired woman. I loved her as much as if she had been my real mother, and that was the reason why I married her daughter. I have heard several different accounts of my father and mother. Only one of them, the one Nanny gave me, can, I imagine, be true. This is what Nanny told me. My father and my uncle were twins. They resembled each other exactly in figure, face and disposition, and even their voices were identical. So it was no easy matter to tell them apart. Moreover, there existed between them a mental bond or sympathy as a result of which, to take an example, if one of them fell ill the other would follow also. In the common phrase, they were like two halves of the one apple. In due course they both decided to go into commerce and, when they reached the age of twenty, they went off to India, where they opened up a business in ray wares, including textiles of various kinds, shot silk, flowered stuffs, cotton piece goods, jubas, shawls, needles, earthenware, fuller's earth, and pen case covers. My father settled in Benares and used to send my uncle on business trips to the other cities of India. After some time, my father fell in love with a girl called Bugam Desai, a dancer in a Lingam temple. Besides performing ritual dances before the great Lingam idol, she served as a temple attendant. She was a hot-blooded, olive-skinned girl, with lemon-shaped breasts, great, slanting eyes and slender eyebrows which met in the middle. On her forehead she, she wore a streak of red paint. At this moment I can picture Bugam Desai, my mother, wearing a gold embroidered sari of colored silk, and around her head a fillet of brocade, her bosom bare, her heavy tresses, black as the dark night of eternity, gathered in a knot behind her head, bracelets on her wrists and ankles, and a gold ring in her nostril, with great, dark, languid, slanting eyes and brilliantly white teeth, dancing with slow, measured movements to the music of the setter, a three-stringed instrument resembling a mandolin. The drum, the lute, the cymbal and the horn, a soft, monotonous music played by bare-bodied men in turbans, a music of mysterious significance, concentrating in itself all the secrets of wizardry, the legends, the passion, and the sorrow of the men of India, and, as she performs her rhythmic evolutions, her voluptuous gestures, the consecrated movements of the temple dance, Bugam Desai unfolds like the petals of a flower. 
A tremor passes across her shoulders and arms. She bends forward and again shrinks back. Each movement has its own precise meaning and speaks a language that is not of words. What an effect must all this have had upon my father? Above all, the voluptuous significance of the spectacle was intensified by the acrid, peppery smell of her sweat mingling with the perfume of champak and sandalwood oil, perfumes redolent of the essences of exotic trees and arousing sensations that slumbered hitherto in the depths of the consciousness. I imagine these perfumes as resembling the smell of the drug box, of the drugs which used to be kept in the nursery and which, we were told, came from India, unknown oils from a land of mystery, of ancient civilization. I feel sure that the medicines I used to take had that smell. All these things revived distant, dead memories in my father's mind. He fell in love with Bugam Desai, so deeply in love that he embraced the dancing girl's religion, the Lingam cult. After some time the girl became pregnant and was discharged from the service of the temple. Shortly after I was born my uncle returned to Benares from one of his trips. Apparently, in the matter of women as in all others, his reactions were identical with my father's. He fell passionately in love with my mother, and in the end he satisfied his desire, which, because of his physical and mental resemblance to my father, was not difficult for him to do. As soon as she learned the truth my mother said that she would never again have anything to do with either of them unless they agreed to undergo trial by Cobra. In that case she would belong to whichever of the two came through alive. The trial consisted of the following. My father and my uncle would be enclosed together in a dark room, like a dungeon, in which a cobra had been let loose. The first of them to be bitten by the serpent would, naturally, cry out. Immediately a snake charmer would open the door of the room and bring the other out into safety. Bukum Desai would belong to the survivor. Before the two were shut up in the dark room, my father asked Bugam Desai if she would perform the sacred temple dance before him once more. She agreed to do so and, by torchlight, to the music of the snake charmer's pipe, she danced, with her significant, measured, gliding movements, bending and twisting like a cobra. Then my father and uncle were shut up in the room with the serpent. Instead of a shriek of horror, what the listeners heard was a groan blended with a wild, goose-flesh-raising peal of laughter. When the door was opened, my uncle walked out of the dark room. His face was ravaged and old, and his hair, the terror aroused by the sound of the cobra's body as it slid across the floor, by its furious hissing, by its glittering eyes, by the thought of its poisonous fangs, and of its loathsome body shaped like a long neck terminating in a spoon-shaped protuberance, and a tiny head, the horror of all this had changed my uncle, by the time he walked out of the room, into a white-haired old man. In accordance with the terms of the contract Bugam Desai belonged henceforth to my uncle. The frightful thing was that it was not certain that the survivor actually was my uncle. The trial had deranged his mind, and he had completely lost his memory. He did not recognize the infant, and it was this that made them decide he must be my uncle. May it not be that this story has some strange bearing upon my personal history, and that that gooseflesh raising peal of laughter and the horror of the trial by Cobra have left their imprint upon me, and are somehow pertinent to my destiny? From this time on I was nothing more than an intruder, an extra mouth to feed. In the end my uncle, or my father, whichever it was, accompanied by Bugam Desai, returned to the city of Rayon business. They brought me with them, 
and left me with his sister, my aunt. My nurse told me that my mother, when saying goodbye, handed my aunt a bottle, a bottle of wine to keep for me. It was a deep red wine, and it contained a portion of the venom of the cobra, the Indian serpent. What more suitable keepsake could such a woman as Bugam Desai have found to leave to her child? Deep red wine, an elixir of death which would bestow everlasting peace. Perhaps she also had pressed out her life like a cluster of grapes, and was now giving me the wine which it had yielded, that same venom which had killed my father. I understand now how precious was the gift she gave me. Is my mother still alive? Perhaps at this moment as I write she is bending and twisting like a serpent, as though it were she whom the cobra had bitten, dancing by torchlight in an open space in some far-off city of India, while women and children and intent, bare-bodied men stand around her and my father, or my uncle, white-haired and bent sits somewhere on the edge of the circle watching her, and remembers the dungeon, and the hissing of the angry cobra, as it glided forward, its head raised high, its neck swelling. Like a scoop, and the spectacle-shaped lines on the back of its head steadily expanding, and deepening in color. At all events I was a little baby, when I was entrusted to the care of my nurse. Nanny also suckled my aunt's daughter, the bitch my wife. I grew up in the family of my aunt, the tall woman with the gray hair around her temples, in the same house as the bitch, her daughter. Ever since I can remember I looked upon my aunt as a mother and loved her deeply. I loved her so deeply that later on I married her daughter, my foster sister, simply because she looked like her. Or rather, I was forced to marry her. She gave herself to me only once. I shall never forget it. It happened by the bedside of her dead mother. Late at night, after everyone had gone to bed, I got up in my nightshirt and drawers and went into the dead woman's room to say goodbye to her for the last time. Two camphor candles were burning at her head. A Quran had been laid on her stomach to prevent the devil from entering her body. I drew back the sheet which covered her and saw my aunt again, with her dignified, pleasant face, from which, it seemed, all traces of earthly concerns had been effaced. She wore an expression before which I involuntarily bowed my head, and at the same time I felt that death was a normal, natural thing. The corners of her lips were fixed in a faintly ironical smile. I was about to kiss her hand and go out when, turning my head, I saw with a start that the bitch who is now my wife had come into the room. There in the presence of her dead mother she pressed herself hard against me, held me close, and kissed me long and passionately on the lips. I could have sunk into the ground with shame but I had not the strength of mind to do what I should have done. The dead woman, her teeth visible, looked as though she was mocking us. I had the impression that her expression had changed from the quiet smile she had been wearing before. Mechanically I held the girl in my arms and returned her kiss, when suddenly the curtain draped across the doorway leading to the next room was drawn aside, and my aunt's husband, the bitch's father, came into the room. He was a bent old man, and he was wearing a scarf wrapped around his neck. He burst into a hollow, grating, goose-flesh-raising peal of laughter, of a quality to make the hairs on one's body stand on end. His shoulders were shaking, and yet he did not look in our direction. I could have sunk into the ground with shame. If I had had the strength, I should have slapped the dead face, which was gazing mockingly at us. I was overcome with shame and fled blindly from the room. And I had the bitch to thank. 
The chances are that she had arranged the whole thing in advance, so as to put me into a position where I should be forced to marry her. And in fact, foster brother and sister though we were, I was obliged to marry her to save her reputation. She was not a virgin, but I was unaware of the fact, and indeed was in no position to know of it. I only learned it later from people's gossip. When we were alone together in the bridal chamber on the first night she refused to undress, despite all my begging and praying, and would only say, it's the wrong time of the month. She would not let me come near her, but put out the light, and lay down to sleep on the other side of the room from me. She was trembling like a willow tree. Anyone might have thought she had been shut up in a dungeon with a dragon. I shall probably not be believed, and indeed the thing passes belief, when I say that she did not once allow me to kiss her on the lips. The next night also I slept on the floor as I had done the night before, and similarly on the night that followed. I could not work up the courage to do anything else. And so a considerable period went by, during which I slept on the floor on the other side of the room from my wife, wife. Who would believe it? For two months, no, for two months and four days, I slept apart from her on the floor, and could not work up the courage to come near her. She had prepared her virginity token beforehand. I don't know, perhaps she had sprinkled the cloth with the blood of a partridge, or perhaps it was a cloth she had kept from the first night of her gallantries in order to make a bigger fool of me. At the time everyone was congratulating me. They were winking at one another and I suppose they were saying to one another, the lad took the fortress by storm last night, while I put the best face on it that I could and pretended I noticed nothing. They were laughing at me, at my blindness. I made a resolution to write the whole story down some day. I found out later that she had lovers right and left. It may be that the reason she hated me was that a preacher, by the process of reciting a few words in Arabic over us, had placed her under my authority. Perhaps she simply wanted to be free. Finally, one night I made up my mind to share her bed by force, and I carried out my resolve. After a tussle she got out of the bed, and left me, and the only satisfaction I had was that I was able to curl up and sleep the rest of the night in her bed which was impregnated with the warmth and the odor of her body. The only time I enjoyed peaceful sleep was that night. After that she slept in a different room from me. When I came back to the house after dark she would still be out. Or rather, I would not know whether she had returned home or not, and I did not care to know, since solitude and death were my destiny. I desired at all costs to establish contact with her lovers. This is another thing that will seem incredible, and sought out everyone who I heard had caught her fancy. I put up with every sort of humiliation in order to strike up an acquaintance with them. I toadied to them, urged them to visit my wife, even brought them to the house. And what people she chose. A tribe peddler, an interpreter of the law, a cooked meat vendor, the police superintendent, a shady mufti, a philosopher, their names and titles varied, but none of them was fit to be anything better than assistant to the man who sells boiled sheep's heads. And she preferred all of them to me. No one would believe me if I were to describe the abject self-abasement with which I cringed and groveled to her in them. The reason why I behaved like this was that I was afraid my wife might leave me. I wanted my wife's lovers to teach me deportment, manners, the technique of seduction. However, as a pimp I was not a success, and the fools all laughed in my face. After all, 
How ever could I have learnt manners and deportment from the rabble? I know now that she loved them precisely because they were shameless, stupid, and rotten. Her love was inseparable from filth and death. Did I really want to sleep with her? Was it her looks that had made me fall in love with her? Or was it her aversion to me, or her general behavior, or the deep affection I had felt for her mother since my early childhood, or was it all of these things combined? I simply do not know. One thing I do know, my wife, the bitch, the sorceress, had poured into my soul some poison which not only made me want her, but made every single atom in my body desire the atoms of hers and shriek aloud its desire. I yearned to be with her in some lost island where there would be nobody but us two. I wished that an earthquake, a great storm, or a thunderbolt from the sky might blast all the rabble humanity that was there breathing, bustling, and enjoying life on the far side of the wall of my room, and that only she and I might remain. But even then would she not have preferred any other living creature, an Indian serpent, a dragon, to me? I longed to spend one night with her and to die together with her, locked in her arms. I felt that this would be the sublime culmination of my existence. While I wasted away in agony, the bitch for her part seemed to derive an exquisite pleasure from torturing me. In the end I abandoned all the activities and interests that I had and remained confined to my room like a living corpse. No one knew the secret which existed between us. Even my old nurse, who was a witness of my slow death, used to reproach me on account of the bitch. Behind my back, around me, I heard people whispering, how can that poor woman put up with that crazy husband of hers? And they were right, for my abasement had gone beyond all conceivable limits. I wasted away from day to day. When I looked at myself in the mirror my cheeks were crimson like the meat that hangs outside butchers' shops. My body was glowing with heat, and the expression of my eyes was languid and depressed. I was pleased with the change in my appearance. I had seen the dust of death sprinkled over my eyes. I had seen that I must go. At last they sent word to the doctor, the rabble doctor, the family doctor who, in his own words, had brought us all up. He came into the room in an embroidered turban, and with a beard three hands breadths long. It was his boast that he had in his time given my grandfather drugs to restore his virility, administered grey powders to me, and forced Kasha down the throat of my aunt. He sat down by my bedside and, after feeling my pulse, and inspecting my tongue, gave his professional advice. I was to go on to a diet of ass's milk and barley water, and to have my room fumigated twice a day with mastic and arsenic. He also gave my nurse a number of lengthy prescriptions consisting of herbal extracts and weird and wonderful oils, hyssop, olive oil, extract of licorice, camphor, maidenhair, chamomile oil, oil of bay, linseed, fir tree nuts, and such like trash. My condition grew worse. Only my old gray-haired nurse, who was her nurse also, attended me, bringing me my medicine, or sitting beside my bed, dabbing cold water on my forehead. She would talk about the time when the bitch and I were children. For example, she told me how my wife from early childhood had a habit of biting the nails of her left hand, and would sometimes gnaw them to the quick. Sometimes she would tell me stories, and then I would feel that my life had reversed its course, and I had become a child again, for the stories were intimately associated with my memories of those days. I remember quite plainly that when I was very little, and my wife, and I used to sleep together in the one cradle, a big double cradle, 
my nurse used to tell the same stories. Some things in these stories which then used to strike me as far-fetched now seem perfectly natural and credible to me. My morbid condition had created within me a new world, a strange indistinct world of shapes and colors and desires of which a healthy person could have no conception. In these circumstances the crowding incidents of my nurse's tales struck an echo which filled me with indescribable delight and agitation. I felt that I had become a child again. At this very moment as I write I experience those sensations. They belong, all of them, to the present. They are not an element of the past. It would seem that the behavior, thoughts, aspirations and customs of the men of past ages as transmitted to later generations by the medium of such stories, are among the essential components of human life. For thousands of years people have been saying the same words, performing the same sexual act, vexing themselves with the same childish worries. Is not life from beginning to end a ludicrous story, an improbable, stupid yarn? Am I not now writing my own personal piece of fiction? A story is only an outlet for frustrated aspirations, for aspirations which the storyteller conceives in accordance with a limited stock of spiritual resources inherited from previous generations. If only I could have slept peacefully as I did in the days when I was an innocent child. Then I slept tranquil and easy. Now when I awoke my cheeks were crimson like the meat which hangs in front of butchers' shops, my body was burning hot, and I coughed, how deep and horrible my cough was. It was impossible to imagine from what remote cavity of my body it proceeded. It resembled the coughing of the horses that bring the sheep carcasses each morning to the butcher's shop opposite my window. This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.